Definitely. Right. Uh, okay, guys. We'll get, we'll get cracking. Is that a good time go. to start? I think we've got quite a few attendees on now. Um, yeah, so we've got Dean Gillespie from ProPitch. We've got Ian Craig from ProPitch. going to take us through building our fertilizer program today. It's going to be quite, uh, I suppose, short and, and basic to start with. But the key to these webinars are keeping them um, very interactive. So at the end, we really welcome questions, discussions, and points. So please feel free to, to interact with, with the guys at the end and ask questions or, or make points. You can raise questions during the webinar um, by raising your hand or also um, typing in the question. We'll try and deal with them uh, at the time. If we can, we'll, we'll come back to them at the end. So the floor is for Dean and Ian to take away. Go for it, guys. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Neil. Right, so basically, we're. Um, I'll start the presentation. Ian's going to take over. It's Ian's presentation. Um, however, he's having internet problems at the moment, so I'm sharing the screen, and we're hoping we can kind of carry on going without any issues. I don't like presenting too much on uh, other people's uh, work, so hopefully, Ian can carry on this way. Anyway. So we'll just give you a bit of a brief introduction, introduction to what we do. Uh, now get the slide to turn over will be good. Uh, the team, the ProPitch team is Ian, myself, Greg and uh, Graham. Graham and Greg come in as uh, as assistants as, as and when required and basically Ian and I are the, the main um, pitch guys and if we do need anybody else in now uh, we tend to phone in the likes of Graham and Greg and in fairness they're fantastic. They understand exactly what we try to do and they that support us all the way through mm -hmm. and the same kind of mental um, mentality as us as well. It's probably idiots but enjoy work as well, but professional we too. Um, and, and I've always had to say you want to be the best, surround yourself with about the best. And without doubt, I've got some fantastic guys there with me. So you've got Ian, me, Greg, and there we go, Graham. So just uh, some of the services we do. It's a strategy, uh, quality assurance, maintenance, design and construction, and education and training. We will work hands-on with the ground staff, and that's part and parcel of what we do as well. I believe um, Paul Georgi uh, Palmer's on here as well. He's, he does very similar, but the sounds of it, uh, mainly in the Spanish countries. But uh, it'd be nice to catch up with you at some point um, over the next couple of days or weeks and see if we can uh, work a partnership with you as well, man. Uh, some of the countries we've worked in, some of the clients, AFC, FIFA, UEFA, CAF and the Indian Super League. Um, as you can see, we're supported then with sports labs in some of these places anyway. Yeah. Uh, we're supported in, um, with sports labs in some of these places as we got satellite companies around the world. Um, Neil can tell you pretty much where they are. Neil, are you there? No, he's going to mute. No worries. Um, so we have also then we got the app and we use this app to kind of remotely manage the pitches, uh, which is a unique sports turf management tool which provides managers, consultants, grounds managers, managers and the, uh, the ability to manage sports pitch performance all year round. Uh, enables grounds managers and consultants to perform assessments in the field from any mobile device which is available on Android and also iPhone. So over to Ian. Okay, thanks Dean. Um, like Dean had said, I've been having some, some internet issues here, so I'm, unfortunately I'm, I'm not switching the webcam on, which is probably a good thing for everybody, but I'm not switching the webcam on just to try and uh, try and take the pressure off a little bit, and Dean's going to Dean's gonna share the screen for me. So I do apologise if I drop out um, at any point, but it'll be seamless. You won't even notice. Dean will pick it up and uh, you'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll crack on as much as possible. But as Dean says, like I say, a lot of our... our uh, our work is in supporting and and, and looking looking to uh, you know support clients and and, and pitches organisations throughout the world. Um, and one of the things that we very often are are asked to do is is, is provide assistance in, in building fertilizer programs, which is something obviously that we're just going to focus on some of the basics of that today. Um, and just if you see on that first slide there, I've put how, how much do I need to apply? Well, that's that's well, very often the, the the sort of the big question but what what I'm going to do really is is the way I I would work is sort of take it take it take it back um to the very basic steps at the beginning before um before we put together this plan and actually working out how, how much we need to apply so if you click on Dean the next screen um so first things first obviously 
is is knowing your pitch itself. Um, the groundsman, the grounds manager, knows better than anybody else how that pitch performs, what that pitch is 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 needing. So we really need that that sort of input. If you if you know the pitch, and it goes everything from the soil type, the weather conditions, the usage levels, grass type, and the actual expectations themselves. So depending on on the level of pitch, um, you know, and the, the, the level of usage, the grass type, weather conditions, and the underlying soil, these play a huge role in what you're what you're actually going to what you're actually going to apply. But at the very beginning, when you're looking to to put together a fertilizer, basically your input of nutrients over the next over the next year, let's say, first step is always going to be the soil test. If you get if you get a full spectrum soil analysis done, um, you know then what you've got there and where your deficiencies are. That then allows you to adjust uh, adjust your inputs to suit. You know, it's, it's all well and good looking at previous records or looking at how somebody else does it or taking advice from people. But the most important thing is knowing what you've actually got and what you actually need. Um, before you move forward with it so the first step is always get get the soil test and see what your uh, see what levels you got once you get these these soil to give you a better idea then of 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 what's needed and how, how you're going to go ahead and build build that plan um if you can skip on dean the next slide please um the other thing as well though as well as as well as using the numbers as well as getting the lab to, to identify where you're lacking like i say you as the grounds manager you as the, the 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 grounds person nobody knows that better than you so if you see something isn't right if you 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 can identify what's actually wrong it gives you a better idea again of of of, of what you need to apply you know if your pitch isn't performing if the color's not right if the the density isn't there um so you need to be able to identify where the problem actually lies like i say the soil test very very important and that it will identify your your nutrient levels but using using your eyes um is is equally important and um basically each deficiency a deficiency in, in, in different nutrients they all display different symptoms and quite often they can be quite similar but it gives you if you know what you're looking for it gives you a better idea um of, of where to start in order to in order to actually rectify this and i'm going to go through a few of the nutrient deficiencies and just just i mean i'm sure i'm i'm, I'm preaching to the the converted here but just really is a bit of a refresher like i say we're going back to some of the basics of the uh, of nutrient deficiencies here and just what to look for obviously nitrogen being the the big one it's the it's the main building block of your of your your plants your your proteins and amino acids if you don't have enough nitrogen it's as simple as the turf appears to be very very yellow you don't get that growth there's a, a, a severe lack of growth and that's generally the first place you're going to look is so put some nitrogen on it see if that see if that fixes the problem um next again i'm going to do these in sort of in, in, in order of in my opinion and in most people's opinion i'm sure importance phosphorus being the next one and again it's it's a little harder to identify and you don't especially if you're looking at a sort of natural natural soil rather than a than a sand-based root zone um you don't necessarily often see the phosphorus deficiency but we are dealing very often in the in a sports construction a, a sand based root zone which is generally very sterile and not doesn't have a huge amount of nutritional value phosphorus is one that that, that you will tend to see and it's it's, it's important um and in, and in, in establishing uh in establishing your pitch again if we're dealing with high-end pitches that are generally looking at a, a new surface and establishing from seed every year the phosphate becomes critically important you do tend to see stunted growth which again could be could be applied to a number of different um nutrients but with the phosphorus the the key thing to look for is that sort of reddish purple tint that you see around the leaf tips generally that is that is an indication of, of a phosphorus deficiency um 
And again, when you're you're looking at phosphorus, there may well be some some phosphorus, and this is where it becomes important that you use your eyes rather than the soil the soil test as well, or use a combination of the two. But a soil test will tell you how much phosphorus is actually available. Phosphorus itself is very uh, relatively immobile um, in the soil when temperatures are are low. So in the springtime, you're looking at low soil temperatures. Quite often, there may well be phosphorus reserves in the in the soil, with it being sort of relatively immobile when it's cold. You do tend to see that um, that deficiency uh, symptoms in the plant, in which case you may look to, you know, implement some kind of foliar phosphorus application if if um, if that's available to you, just to just to give the plant what it needs at, at that early stage of the year. But the critical thing you're looking for with the phosphorus is that that purpling, uh, reddish tint to the to the leaf tips. That's that's usually the the key indicator in in, in most cases of a phosphorus deficiency. Okay, Dean. Potassium again. That's the 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 third of the big three, the macro uh, nutrients. Really, potassium. You tend to see it's it's very important in sort of cell wall formation and and uh, moisture uh, regulation within the plant. Generally, lacking potassium, the the plant. Uh, is very lacking in, in, in sort of stress tolerance in general, but the most common one or the one we're, we're most likely to see um, the onset of is drought tolerance. So if your potassium levels are low, um, then there's a good chance that the, the drought tolerance of that plant is is, is going to be particularly low. Um, again, if you're having to water, if you're checking moisture levels, if you're, you're keeping... Uh, you're keeping your moisture levels where they need to be, but you're still seeing signs of, of drought symptoms or very quickly exhibiting drought symptoms, the chances are you've got a potassium deficiency. Again, you could be applying some potassium or get a soil test and just double check these things. But it's just giving you an idea that the um, the key indicators to look for um, before you before you go ahead and apply. Calcium again, uh, one of the one of the more uh, more commonly applied um, nutrients. It's, it's, it's in a lot of the fertilizers. It's in a lot of the granular fertilizers and, and, and foliar and liquid feeds that are out there. Again, if you if you if you get that that imbalance, you have an imbalance in, in calcium. Again, you're looking at stunted growth um, and particularly a stunted root system. Which again, when you're trying to establish from from seed, the the, the root systems critical in establishing those roots as, as as early as possible is a critical part in establishing your turf. So if your calcium levels are low, again, you're going to get that stunted stunted root development, which um, in turn is going to cause you cause you some serious problems in terms of um, traction and stability of the surface. The other thing to look for is chlorotic yellowing of the of the leaf tips. Again, this is quite a common one. You'll see that with a lot of nutrient deficiencies, that, that chlorosis. This is where it's 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 important that we have not only that understanding of what we're looking for, but also the soil tests so that we can we can identify where this where this deficiency is. Next Dean. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Magnesium. Again, it's sort of critical in the in the chlorophyll development within the plant. You again, you put down your your fertilizers that, that contain a lot of the granules these days contain magnesium oxide. Um, you know, the, it's 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 not uncommon to see sort of foliar magnesium applied, and you get that green up effect that you um, without getting necessarily a flush of growth, and it's simply because the, the you know the magnesium plays a critical part in the in the development of the, the chlorophyll within the plant. Um, so if you have a magnesium deficiency, you very often see this intravenal yellowing. It's a sort of striping effect within the plant. Um, again, it can quite often be confused with an iron deficiency, which we'll, we'll come on and talk about as well. But again, like I say, you can combine the two. You could be applying iron but still having that yellowing, because um, iron is obviously a, a common one that we, we all apply for the green up. The chances are if you're still getting that yellowing, 
is potentially that magnesium deficiency there. So we need to top that up. Sulfur. This is very similar actually to nitrogen, and again, it's 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 very often seen in the 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 young younger leaves uh, leaves certainly before before the older ones. But it's a sort of critical part in the the, the development of a sward when you're developing from seed. So uh, again, if you if you're applying nitrogen but still getting that um, that yellowing or not getting the effect of the nitrogen that you 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 think you should be getting, the chances are that what, what you want to look for is, uh, again, back to your soil test, what are my sulfur levels like? Do I need to top up them? Uh, do I need to top up that sulfur? Because it's, uh, like I say, it's, it's, it's very similar effect. Very often, the first thing is we'll just throw down a fertilizer, we'll throw down nitrogen, but you're not necessarily going to get that, uh, that response you want if you're lacking in other nutrients. So, like I say, sulfur, the symptoms can be very similar to nitrogen, but it's it's worth knowing. It's 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 an important uh, it's an important micronutrient again in the the development of the plant. Iron, and again we've, we've covered it really, but very similar to magnesium, um, particularly in sort of more alkaline soils, we tend to see see more um, iron deficiency. But uh, it's, it's quite a commonly applied foliar product, and it does give you that similar effect to the, the magnesium. It gives you the, the that green up, and again, it's just due to the the, the important role that the iron plays in the sort of chlorophyll production of the plant. But again, can be very very easily confused an iron deficiency with the magnesium deficiency. So again, if you're getting that yellowing, but you think your nutrient inputs are, are where they should be. Refer back to that soil test and check what your uh, what your iron levels are and your magnesium levels are. Chances are, if you're getting that yellowing, certainly that sort of striped yellowing, the intravenal yellowing, there'll be a deficiency of either iron or or magnesium. Again, it's important that we understand what's actually in there before we just apply products for the sake of it. We want to make sure we're getting the the most out of our products. We're getting the the we're spending our money where it needs to be spent. So again, if we understand what we're looking for in terms of, of nutrient deficiencies and in terms of reading a, a, a soil analysis report, it allows us to, to build that fertilizer plan um, in a more informed manner. It's not just throwing products at it and hoping that it goes green. Um, just really to, to, to sum up in terms of micronutrients, if anybody out there can tell me what a boron or a molybdenum deficiency looks like, then I'm all ears. You can take the floor because uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you. In 20 years of doing this, I, uh, I've still never seen a boron deficiency on a football pitch. Uh, it's it's there in very trace amounts throughout your uh, throughout your your fertilizers. Most of what you're applying does have. Uh, does have these these sort of very trace amounts of these trace elements, but if I'm being perfectly honest, honest, and you know some might call me a bit cynical, I've still never seen a boron or a molybdenum deficiency, and quite frankly, can't tell you what it looks like. So um, it sort of for me sums up the 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 importance. If if you know what I mean, it, it, it's. We've got to prioritise. We've got to sort of understand what what we need to be focusing on. And um, all too often, I think there's a little bit too much science put into these things. And there's a little bit too much focus on some of the things that that aren't as important. And you know, if we get those macros and the more important micronutrients, if we get those uh, spot on, then you know, there's a it's it's most of the battle. Um, I would also highlight at this point where we're talking about um, soil testing and, and, and nutrients, uh, nutrient usage and availability. I'd never underestimate the importance of pH. It's one of the first things I'll ask when I see a deficiency in something. Can't always tell what it is. Like I say, a lot of these are very similar. If I see that a pitch is, is, is deficient in something, one of the first questions I always ask is, what's, what's your pH? The reason I ask this is 
if you look on the, the, the slide at the moment, if you look at that chart again, I'm sure everybody's seen this um, in the past. The majority of pretty much every one of those nutrients that that, that we've uh, that we've covered here between 6.5 and 7.5 is that optimum range it's the optimum range for for nutrient availability and nutrient uptake some of these uh, some of them again i mentioned iron if you're particularly alkaline iron availability becomes low again the more acidic the soil is the iron availability is high magnesium goes the opposite way but if you look at that 6.5 to 7.5 range again we're in the optimum for your iron and your magnesium so when you're looking at your nutrient inputs one of the first things you, you should be looking at is a soil ph because if you're in that range then these nutrients are generally all available these these nutrients are if you, if you are deficient in something then when you apply it you should see you should see the benefits of that however if your if your ph is too low or too high doesn't matter if you've got a low ph doesn't matter how much magnesium you're applying a lot of the time you're wasting your money because it's not available within the within the soil when it's when it's strongly acidic and you know the opposite can be said about iron and manganese for example if you if you're if you're strongly alkaline you're going to see deficiencies in them so if you can keep your ph buffered you know quite often applying something just to maybe make the, the soil slightly more acidic or slightly more alkaline you'll get a reaction as if you've applied a fertilizer because what happens is you're 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 freeing up that that nutrient that's been locked up in the soil that stuff that's been unavailable because of the ph and next slide dean thanks and similarly just looking at some of the um some of the so cool season grasses here i don't know if we've got any warm season guys on at the moment i'll apologize if we do but these are just focusing on on the cool season grasses but again looking at the ones that we, we are generally dealing with in a in a sports pitch um in a cool season your perennial rye grass and your smooth stock meadow grass of kentucky blue um we're looking there around that 6.5 to 5 being the the optimum range for these these turf grasses so again and over the importance of, of making sure that ph is, is balanced if you if you've got the ph where it needs to be you're facilitating you know growing these grass species you're facilitating getting the best out of these fertilizers that you can get so it's it's every bit as critical as the actual nutrient levels themselves as the as the ph it's just worth bearing that in mind as we sort of uh as and when we we, we look to build that that fertilizer program okay dean so the sort of basics again as 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 i suppose when we're when we're looking to put that plan together is what what are we actually trying to achieve well we're all trying to achieve that healthy turf we want adequate growth um which is going to generally as a general rule we want that sort of consistent growth throughout the year we want to maintain that turf at, at a healthy level we do however and particularly when we're talking about sports pitches we do have to make sure that we we have enough in reserve not just to have steady growth we need to be able to get as and when we need them flushes of growth in order to recover from damage if it's a heavy use schedule or matches played in, in poor conditions this can have a very sort of detrimental effect on the on the turf health itself so we need to have that nutrient available there to, to accelerate that recovery um, we also need to try and minimize stress as much as possible give the grass the best possible chance of of, of tolerating that stress as well as minimizing the disease pressure and a lot of that comes down to um getting your your inputs accurate now that's not to say keeping them low or keeping them high it's making sure it's accurate because you have some uh, turf grass diseases and particularly if you're dealing in a, a stadium environment which is not a natural environment for grass to be growing you have diseases that are brought on by a lack of nutrition 
weakness in the plant, but you also have diseases that can be that can be brought on by too much nutrition. You have too much sort of lush growth at the top. You know, your your fusarium, for example, it loves it. So sometimes you'll find if your nutrition levels, particularly if your nitrogen levels are too high, you'll look at getting fusarium, whereas we may be looking at things like red thread if um if the nutrient levels are low. So it's important that we get them that we get them absolutely accurate. And again, that's a very it can be a very broad statement. It can be a very broad um spectrum of, of, of what you you actually need to apply. And again, it comes back to the very first slide where I've said as as long as you know the site, as long as you understand what you're dealing with, you know nutrition levels, you know your soil type, you know your your usage levels, conditions. If you know all of these, it gives you the better uh, better information it allows you to sort of better um make a more informed decision as to what what fertilizers you actually need to apply and when so moving on um very very basic diagram i've got here of nitrogen uptake again i'm not going to go too uh, in depth into this but we can you know we can refer back to this if uh the, the session I think has been recorded so we can sort of refer back to that but it gives you a bit of an idea of what goes on within the soil when you apply these fertilizers I'm going to go on and just talk a little bit about various different types of fertilizer and and, and, and how they work so just looking at, at, at this basically as, as your, your, your sort of breakdown you've got you know your, your main four main organic uh, sorry nitrogen sources that's your organic ammonium, ureic, and nitric um, nitrogen. Well, they all react differently. Um, they all interact with the plant and the soil differently. So again, having a better understanding of, of, of how these are broken down, how these are taken up by the plant, gives you the information you need to make that decision. What am I looking to achieve from this fertilizer application? Do I want you know sustained growth over a long period? Um, or do I want a flush of growth? I need to recover from a match. I want a flush of growth. What kind of what kind of uh, what kind of uh, granular fertilizer do I need to apply? So I'll move on from that. Like I say, I'm not going to too much uh, too much detail there, Dean. Um, we'll talk a little bit about granular fertilizer um, applications. Um, and as a general rule. Uh, your your granular fertilizers are broken down into kind of three different types. Um, if you skip on Dean, your slow release um, granules tend to come from sort of more complex forms of nitrogen. As I, uh, I said previously, your organic nitrogen compounds or your uh, or more complex um, molecules like methylene urea, for example, which in themselves don't act as the fertilizer, but when they go down into the soil, you're broken down by your aerobic bacteria um, in the soil. They get broken down into a form of nitrogen that can get taken up by the plant, can get utilized. Um, and generally, if you have a well, well drained, well aerated soil, with a decent um, bacterial life, you put down these slow release fertilizers, you'll generally get a sort of sustained uh, release of nutrient, release of nitrogen um, to sort of sustain a relatively uh, consistent growth levels. We also have your controlled release nitrogen, um, which would tend to be coated granules, the compounds such as poly polymer sulfur that coat these, these granules. Again, the, the, the nutrient themselves are held within the granule, but with adequate temperature and adequate moisture, these, uh, these uh, coatings will tend to break down and release the nitrogen again over, or, or release the nutrient um, over a, a, a longer period. Again, it requires adequate temperature and adequate moisture. These products, these products are generally very good. You can put them down, um, and if the conditions aren't right, they will just sit there. They'll stop releasing the nutrition if the grass isn't growing. These these products aren't releasing uh, the nutrient, so it's not been wasted. It's not been um, broken down and leached out of the 
leached out of the soil. And then we've got the conventional release um, fertilizers, which tend to be your more basic um, nitrogen compounds from your urea ammonical and, and urea ammonical and uh, nitric, which again, if we'll look back at the at the slide uh, um, about the, the sort of the simplified nitrogen in the soil slide, if you want, if you look back at that, you get an idea of how these, these fertilizers work. Um, so when you're applying um, products with a high level of ammonium, high levels of, of, of nitrate, these are instantly available for, for the plant. These are instantly available to be taken up by the plant. So um, generally your, your quick release fertilizers, the ones that you're looking to apply to get that flush of growth, um, will be predominantly um, ammonium or, or, or nitrate, um, whereas your urea tends to need that little bit of breakdown into ammonium before it can be taken up uh, by the root. If you go back uh, again, Dean. Uh, yeah, so generally, if we're looking to get that, that flush of growth, if we're looking for that recovery or looking to, to kick the kick the turf on, get it that, that sort of shot in the arm. We're looking at these conventional release um, release granules. And again, if you skip on to the next slide, Dean. If you know again and, and, and when planning ahead, if you you know what you're what you're looking for from these fertilizers, like I say, you tend to find that the, the controlled and the slow release products will be used as a base feed they're sort of drip feeding the nitrogen through the through the, the the growing season you're getting that sort of consistent growth but you still need to use these conventional release granules in order to get that flush in order to get that recovery or you know kick on seedlings these type of things um so provided you know the, the actual source. So rather than when we look at a bag of fertilizer, it always gives us that NPK breakdown and then obviously the micros underneath. Um, and while that's good information and it lets us it lets us understand sort of quantities of nitrogen that we're applying, it lets us it lets us understand um, how, much how much we're using. It's important that we actually look at the the nitrogen derivation itself so we need to know what type of nitrogen we're putting down i.e what kind of response am i going to get if i need an, an instant response if i'm looking to kick that turf on i'm not going to put down methylene urea or a, a, a polymer sulfur coated product i'm going to put down something that's ammonium that's nitrate that's going to get that kick as as quickly as possible um but also you know, I'm not going to put down one of these products as a base feed. There is there is uses for for all types of uh, these fertilizers. We just need to know when to utilize each one. So another one that we'll just touch on as a sort of uh, a top up to to your granular fertilizers. Again, when you're dealing with a with a sort of high-end football pitch particularly on a on a sand-based root zone you're always going to need these granules as the, the sand itself is relatively sterile it's um it's it's not really a particularly good growing medium in terms of nutrient availability so we do need to put down these granules but on top of these granules what we're what we also do is uh, is apply liquid and foliar fertilizer if you skip on dean now I'll clarify from the start because it's something that, that, that quite often gets um, sort of overlooked or, or confused is that just because you're putting down a liquid feed doesn't mean you're putting down a foliar fertilizer. All foliar fertilizers are liquid form when you apply them, simple as that, you spray them onto the leaf, but not every liquid fertilizer you're applying is a foliar feed. Um, so if you go to the next one, Dean. With a foliar feed, a, a, a true foliar feed, um, they tend to be formulated with sort of surfactant and ad additives um, to, to aid in the, the the foliar uptake of the of the nutrient itself. Actually, allow the 
the fertilizer to be to be taken into the plant. So true foliar feed always put down in a low water volume and the finest spray quality generally. What you're looking to do is coat the leaf and then let the let that product dry onto the leaf and be taken up by the plant. We want to minimize um the actual runoff itself. There's no point in putting foliar feeds down and, and you know 800 litre a hectare nozzles you're going to waste most of that and the critical thing you need to know about your your foliar fertilizer versus just a standard liquid feed is it's a relatively small amount of nutrition that goes into your foliar uh, fertilizers because you need it just to be taken up straight away by the plant so anything that goes into the soil is effectively going to be going to be wasted but by foliar feeding what you're doing is you're eliminating the potential for that leaching or locking up in the soil, you're just feeding it directly onto the plant. But we need to make sure that we understand the difference between a true foliar feed and what is effectively liquid fertilizer. So next slide, Dean. So again, like I say, the liquid feeding, you'll tend to use a higher water volume um, and higher levels of nutrition as well. You maybe be putting down a liquid feed at a similar or slightly lesser rate, but generally um, than a granule, but generally far higher than 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 a foliar feed. You may apply with a liquid or a a, a granular. You might be applying 30, 40 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, whereas with a foliar feed, you're only applying two, three, four, but it's going directly into the plant. It's being utilised straight up, whereas with a liquid feeding. Again, you might get some degree of uh, of foliar uptake, but uh, a lot of what you're putting down is just going down into the soil, and it is again readily available. They're, they're very good for getting that flush of growth again with a liquid feed, because as you put that down, it's already solubilized. It's already in in uh, in solution. It's easily taken up by the plant, um, or it's easily broken down by the the soil microbes and and and, and then utilised with the plant. So, as as with the foliar feeding and, and and granules and and liquid, if you take everything together, as long as you understand, as long as you you understand what you're you're uh, you're trying to achieve by this uh, by this application of fertilizer, it give you a better idea what you what you actually need to apply at the time. And if you go on, Dean, yes. and basically, yeah, just in, in conclusion, depending on budget and resource, depending on what you're actually looking to, to achieve, if you can get a good balance of, of granular fertilizer, but also a good balance of the different types of granular fertilizer, also be topping that up with liquids and foliar feeding. And again, just depending on what you're actually trying to achieve, it does always come down to the 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 skill and the knowledge of the, the the grounds person to actually actually decide what and when to apply. But you need to understand if you need to apply it and what you're trying to actually achieve from uh, from that application. Because generally, if you don't um, if you don't get them if you don't get them right, you're going to have weak turf. It's not going to perform right. It's not going to perform the way it's it's supposed to. You're going to lose matches. It's as simple as that. So yeah, just really to sum it up, without the correct inputs, we're going to end up with uh, with poor turf and the matches off. Simple as that. So as that's uh, that's pretty much all I've got to say, and I know a lot of that may have been been some sort of quite quite basic information there, but I think it's important that that we sort of quite often just refresh that and 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 take a look at the the sort of very first steps, the very the, the most basic steps, and what we need to do um, before we put together that fertilizer um, that fertilizer program. So, I mean, open open things up to the the floor really if anybody's got any questions or anything they want to add please feel free
a couple of questions just come through. Firstly, I just want to say thanks to uh, Lee Jackson for finally joining us on that last slide. <laughs> he just sent me a text message now as that last slide was coming through pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, Steve. Hi, Lee. That Steve. might have been our fault for not accepting the registration because he came in a bit late, so it's not Lee's I, fault. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. I wouldn't accept his registration either. Um, <laughs> There's a couple of questions come through. Um, please tell me which chemical can be used to control weeds. Which chemical can be used to control weeds? That depends entirely on the weed. I would, I would, I would say glyphosate that will control every weed, but um, no, I mean it depends entirely on the weed. If we're talking about um, broadleaf uh, species, you know, generally you're you're sort of more common. Uh, 2,4-D, dicamba, mecaprop um, type products will tend to control broadleaf weeds in, in a in a grass sward. Um, th those would be the the sort of main ones. But again, it, it would generally be it's. Uh, I'm going to be product specific. I would need to be weed specific. I would need to know exactly which which weed we're dealing with um, in order to sort of recommend that. A product to to control it. Yeah, and there's another one that's come in now. Ferrous sulphate is suitable for hybrid pitch, uh, Bermuda, hybrid Bermuda grasses? Question mark. Sorry, say that, say that again, Dean. Ferrous sulphate is it suitable for hybrid Bermuda grass? Um, yes, I don't see why not. I think uh, in the right uh, in oh. the right application, Dean. I mean, if you have, if you have any thoughts on that. I've certainly yeah. used plenty of ferrous sulfate on, on Bermuda grass in the past. Yeah, I'd, I'd do a trial area first. I wouldn't check it on straight away. I mean, I'd be a bit concerned about what it could do if it was applied correctly. Um, later at night, maybe, before the, uh, or just before the sunset, rather than middle of the day. Yeah, so I can't see why not, yeah. Yeah, I think if when it, when it comes to, if, you, if you're talking about Bermuda grass, um, obviously it's going to be... Uh, warm climate the the general advice with, with any kind of um any kind of fertilizer application would be to try and do it early morning or late night and make sure that that it's not being done in direct sunlight because there is always that potential for scorching especially with with things like ferrous sulfate which i don't have a problem with using on these these species if you do use it in sort of direct sunlight yeah there's there's potential for scorch because the, the sunlight can be Intense. You also have the potential for when it's as hot as that, the sort of volatilization. You'll lose a lot of the 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 product before it actually hits the plant. It, it it sort of evaporates into the into the atmosphere. So you know, with Bermuda type climates, certainly early morning or, or late at night is is the the best approach for applying these these products. I'm just I'm just going to mute a couple of the guys as well. I don't know if you want to ask questions. I know. Whatsoever, no blood. There was no sign that Redbull Farm had been the scene of any serious assault. There was no no sign of a cleanup. So whilst our efforts were directed at obtaining forensic evidence, those efforts ultimately proved completely fruitless. Jack, we're watching TV. Is he asking the question? I'm not qualified to answer that question, I don't think. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> Jack, you watching TV in the background. <laughs> Weird stuff. Jack, do you have a question? Anybody else have a question? Play, you're there. Dean, I've got one for I've got one, right? Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we do. Right. Um, obviously, just when you are talking about expectations, obviously, I'm working at a lower end of the industry than your top level stadiums. Uh, okay. With regard, with regards environmental impact of putting fertilizers down, uh, whose responsibility do you think it should be? To take it upon themselves to, to reduce the amount of fertilizers put down with regards to environment because obviously is it fair to put it on the head groundsman who's only trying to safeguard their job like 
should more guidance come from above, be it grounds management association or whatever, to be realistic about the level of surface you should be looking to achieve? It's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think you've got to kind of you've got to look at it as well as a head grounds when you've got to do you've got to apply you, you've got to apply what your plant needs. You just don't keep on checking it down just for the sake of it. Because obviously it doesn't do much good for the environment when it does go through the um, the drains and things. Um, who who's responsible? Good question. Because uh, turkeys don't turkeys don't vote for Christmas. You know what I mean. So it's but yeah, at the same yeah. time you're there's yeah. all these things in the news about environment. So it's hard. Yeah, it's um, I, I know there are products out there that that um, will will hold the nutrients within the soil, so you don't get so much leaching anyway. Um, right. There's a couple of suppliers on online that you know they'll have products such as that. Um, yeah, it's, there, there are different kind of uh, products you can use that can retain some of the nutrients in there. You don't want to be chucking on too much. You, you, you want to check on what you want to use sometimes, what you're using, you know. But yeah, you do get leaching as well, so it is a bit, a bit of a tough one. I think as long as you can be shown to be sort of responsible and 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 your mm -hmm. end. I mean, I know of uh, sort of where you know drainage water itself is actually, uh, I guess, filtered through maybe reed beds or or whatever to actually sort of take out any potential nitrates that are going to leach into any groundwater. I think, provided you 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 show due care and attention to these things, you're not just throwing it on willy nilly and not caring where it goes. You know, I think we everyone understands. You know that, that a football pitch, for example, does need additional fertilizer. Does need to be fertilised more than just you know a, a park or whatever. Um, I think as long as you, you you're not completely ignoring that, you are acknowledging and, and doing what you can. You are trying to mitigate that that sort of contamination of groundwater um, as a I suppose the, the the grounds manager that would that would be your responsibility. I think there'd be no shying away from that if you you hadn't taken that sort of integration. But you know, I think that there has to always be that understanding that we are going to be applying an awful lot of fertilizer in the sports turf industry. That's as simple as that. Otherwise, we don't have a sports turf industry. You know. Yeah. And, is that are you comfortable with that player? Yeah, cheers. Yeah. There's um, also a question about after watering on the ground fertilizer application. Is uh, after watering uh, on ground fertilizer, is it right to buy water after after applying fertilizer? Well, yeah, and if if we're talking about let's say a granular fertilizer, we don't want that. Uh, the, the target for that is, uh, is the soil. So um, yeah, I would always say after a granular fertilizer application, yeah, we want to we want to water. Um, if it's a foliar fertilizer application, then you need that product to dry on the leaf, for example, in order for it to be taken up. So uh, uh, no, obviously you don't want to be to be fertilize uh, to be watering after you've after you've applied. Um, but again, that 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 comes down to the 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 planning. You know, do you well first and foremost, do you have an irrigation system? If so, when you apply your granular fertilizer, yeah, it, it needs to be watered in because the target is the the target is the soil. You know, so we want to get it watered down into that soil. Dean, to add to that, just checking. No, no I'm sorry, I've been kind of like thrown in between. Because uh, we had somebody's just come in to do a little bit of work for us as well. So, uh, was got another question. Martin Parrish, do you want to plant foliar feed? In your opinion, what percentage of product is entering the plant, and how much do we lose evaporation in if washed off? So, again, that 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 all comes down to the 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 product itself and the the, the actual, I suppose your your equipment. There are some some very good nozzles specifically for foliar feeding these days um if you get the sort of again i would always refer to label recommendations they tend to be 
they tend to be pretty accurate in terms of what you're applying. I think if you follow all the recommendations and, and, and you do have, for example, a, a four hour window after after foliar feeding to let it to let the product dry and, and then be, be taken up, you probably get a high proportion of it taken in. Um, but then if you if you apply and it rains half an hour afterwards, there's a good chance you'll you'll lose a lot of that into the into the soil. Um, so just to go on that, studies have actually proven that within 15 minutes of applying foliar feed, the plant will absorb up to 70% of that um, that foliar application. Yeah. You obviously, you know, that's for what lands in the leaf, what misses the leaf, and if it rains, then it'll just wash straight through. But what actually lands in the leaf within 15 minutes, 70% of that plant um actually just taking up some of the nutrients so it's pretty pretty good it doesn't react straight away but it's quite quick i used to think it was two hours but uh really not, it was, it was a lot less than that yeah i think that the, the other thing that the sort of i suppose slightly frustrating thing about your foliar feeds is because you're putting down sort of such small amounts as well you don't tend to see that that huge response that you would from you know, a, a granular feed or or a liquid feed because you're just putting down small amounts to sort of top up. You, it's, it's, it's hard to say. You, you, you look at it and go, I don't know if I've had a response from that. I don't know if I've had the reaction I wanted. It may almost seem like you're, you know, you've, you've lost a fair proportion of it when technically it has been taken up and utilised, but because you're only applying maybe four or five kgs of of N, you're not going to get a huge growth response from it. And just go back on to um, the question I was asked earlier about fertilizer as well. If it's granular, uh, without doubt, you want to be applying water straight after that, or or do as we do. If you don't if you don't have irrigation systems, you literally wait for the rain to come in and then apply the fertilizer before the rain comes in. You don't want to leave the granular fertilizer on the field; it could end up squashing the plant. Hi, Ian. Uh, Neil here. Just a question regarding nitrogen in stadium environment. What kind of application rate are we looking at for a year? Is there a, is there a maximum? I mean, I know it's discussed quite regularly, but what's your take on that? Well, I mean, it, it's something that, that, that does get, get discussed. And it was the, the, the question I posed on the first slide is how much how much N do I apply? Um, it, it does always sort of boil down to that. And the, the answer is, again, if you're talking a sort of high end, Stadium environment, you know, you're probably looking at if it's a sand based root zone, you know, you're probably looking at 500 kgs of N as a minimum, but that could be as wide ranging as, you know, 500 up to, you know, because some places are applying over a thousand. It just depends on the, the intensity of the intensity of usage, um, weather conditions, and, and such like. But, you know, it can lights as well. Sorry, yeah. say that, Dean. Lights and the soil heating now will the, the plant will absorb more uh, nitrogen if the temperatures are hotter through the lights and the undersoil heating. Yeah, I mean, if you look at sort of old old textbooks, it will tell you that you know you apply three hundred kgs of of nitrogen a year as a as a maximum. You know, the plant can't can't take up any more than that. I think it's, it's we're, we're we're moving on. Um, and, and, and technology, as Dean says, lights and under soil heating. You know, we're growing grass all year round nowadays. I think, and, and certainly, sort of relatively high end stadium environment, you're looking at kind of 500 kgs as a as a minimum. Um, certainly, in a sand based root zone. Any other questions? I've got, I've got, I've got one wee one, Dean. Um, I don't obviously when you are going through symptoms of, um, I've gone through the symptoms of different um, deficiencies. We had a, it was a noticeable 
it was the end of February, at the natural soil pitches that have been top dressed with sand over the years. The, the end of February, we'd had a very wet February. Um, on the plant, half of the plant was greying, half of the plant was healthy green. Right. Pretty much down the spine. Have you any ideas on that one? Is that a Wind nutrient thing or is that... Was it windy? Um, not and not noticeably. Yeah, it, I mean it's it's kind of lots of kind of different things. Don't forget if it's if it's raining heavily, that plant is leaching out a lot of nutrients as well, isn't it? So it's not. Yeah. It, you might need to put on more nutrients than that. Ian, what what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, again, it's it, it's quite, it's quite hard to say without um sort of haven't seen it you know so some was uh, again was, was the was being used at the time as it was it the pitch under sort of relative intensive usage so like we have nine rugby pitches and from a distance you could see the pitch the pitch was a graying color a slightly graying when you looked at it mm -hmm. up close it was half the plant directly not, down the spine no no is that consistent across the pitch Consistent. Uh, there, right. there was pockets which were more wee pockets that, that which were more, but it was consistent across the whole area. Would you say mm. those pockets were more in areas where they've been used more often? Uh, no, because there were no. I I've I've been racking my brain for the last two months. I thought I'll ask. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, because you, you do get a bit of anthracnose as well, which is kind of stress leaf, stress plant, mainly in the high wear areas. You also see it where the machines turn. So I'm just wondering yeah. something like that. I mean, without you, you obviously do your pH test and get your analysis and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the head groundsman gets it done before the fertilizing, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, some of that might end up giving you some indications. But no, just, no worries. I know it's hard to do it. It's hard to do it without seeing it. I just thought off the top of your head, you might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a green, I'll have a look into that as well. But uh, it could potentially even be something, something mechanical. It could be the mowing equipment itself if it's if it's sort of grey and if you if you're not if you're not because get, I, I seen, I seen it. At my, of, I seen it at the last work as well, and I thought that's the exact same thing. Right. I'd love to see a picture of it. See, see, see if you had a, see if you had a picture of it. You could send that on. I, I, I'd love to see it. Maybe uh, share it. I'll send it by WhatsApp. Blame my number hasn't changed. So yeah, send it across for definitely. No. Well, mm. Matt, Matt, you're still there. Have you ever come across something like that? Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to say without seeing it because, you know, if you can send a couple of pictures of a cross um that'd be great what did you spray did you spray or put down anything before i don't i said did you do any applications before you saw it uh no it just went about of, like, the the areas that were treated because it was obviously a massive site with nine pitches within it but the areas which weren't being so areas off the pitch also had this as well so it wasn't, it wasn't as. What were the what were the weather conditions leading up to that? January was wet. February was very wet. But I'll I'll have a I'll have a look through my phone and I'll send it to you on WhatsApp, Dean. Was yeah, uh, Greg just meant asked now is it waterlogging? Was it wet there? Like That's it on. was, it was yeah. non-stop rain for February. Yeah, but was that area flooded? Heavy. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Possibly yeah. that. I can well, confirm that, Blair. You're about a kilometre from my house, and there was a lot of rain in February and January. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's not even that time. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, any more questions for Ian and Dean before we split? I think it's been pr pretty productive. It's good to get the discussion going at the end. That's a, that's a gold dust. That's what everyone wants. So yeah. any more questions, fire away. If not, we'll, we'll close up for today. 
No, I'm all good. I thought it was decent. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, guys. Right. Thank, thank you very much, Ian. Great presentation, and Dean as well. Thank you. Uh, everyone stay safe, and we'll promote any future webinars um, a bit more advanced this time. So, so keep your eye on the social media feeds, and we'll we'll feed out to the registered people from this one and the last one as well. Okay. Cheers, guys. Catch you later. Thanks. Take care, everyone. See you later. Bye, everyone.